liberalism is essentially moral syphilis. Last year, Mirswalda came on to talk about his ideology of integralism, and I recommend you check that out before this video. There's a link in the top right of the screen and in the description. He recently asked to do another interview to clear some things up from the last interview and go deeper into his worldview. So to begin, how has your ideology changed since the last interview? Good evening. No, I don't believe my ideology has changed much at all. In fact, it's safe to say that my ideology hasn't changed much since I first became aware of the political sphere. What are your thoughts on the religious uniformity of a nation? In many places, an ethnic group is split by religion, or multiple ethnic groups in the same region share religion. In terms of your ideal nations, are they based on religion or race? Ideally, a nation is based on, well, a nation, which in my opinion more or less correlates to ethnicity. Religion is a slightly more complex issue. The one should bear in mind that at least in the UK, the I mean, Protestant churches, the Church of England, and to some extent the Church of Scotland, are quite similar to the Catholic Church in their high forms. In terms of ceremony, ideally, a nation would follow one single religion. A little variation within that, but history can often mar this. Ruined Catholicism and the high forms of Anglicanism, Lutheranism and Presbyterianism are Christian faiths but explicitly in a European tradition, hence the incorporation of what many Protestants might term as pagan elements. In many cases, religions are not actually supposed to be universalist, and certainly in pre-Christian Europe, religions were limited to, to particular tribal groups whose religions were on an ancestral and nature basis. In that case, do you believe in objective religion? Do you believe that the God of the Bible is objectively real? I do believe he is, that my personal relationship with God is often tested, and I find myself far closer to figures such as the Virgin Mary and various patron saints associated with me and things I do. The objectivity of the stories in a religion, in my opinion, are almost irrelevant. Religion is about communal ritual and having regular spiritual experiences, perpetuating the rites of ancestors. For me, Christianity is about the Greek cathedrals, the sainthoods, choirs singing well-beloved hymns, and all the annual festivals that come with it. If you don't believe in the objectivity of your religion, what is the justification for reinforcement of religious hegemony? I would avoid confusing my belief that it would be irrelevant if it wasn't objective, for me actually not thinking my religion is objective, and I can and could talk at length as to my metaphysical justifications for a creator. But yes, the justification is for the reasons above. This is a matter of tradition and communal ritual, bringing the community together to partake in a spiritual activity, sing together and feast together. Christianity for the West is not just the Bible and slightly peculiar Midwestern evangelicals gargling away in so-called tongues. It's our shared festivals, our architecture, literature, artwork and more. It's an immense part of our civilizational framework. I'm sure many Romans didn't actually believe in Jupiter or Mars, but they never questioned their importance as cultural figures in the idea of Rome itself. In your ideal society, what do you do about people who don't want to participate in these beliefs and practices? In such a society, that would largely police itself. Someone defying cultural norms would just be seen as rather an odd person. Beliefs and practices here are also two different things. Frankly, I don't care whether someone or not believes in the stories of a religious canonical text. The important thing is that they recognise that religion as being intrinsic to the culture and fabric of the nation and wider civilization. For example, I come from a village where church attendance isn't low but also isn't high much of the year. But in the specific festivals, the church is packed because it becomes a focal point for the community. They want to sing Christmas carols together and then chat afterwards with mince pies and port, etc, etc. Anyone who doesn't get involved feels left out and not part of the community. I have no doubt that many are atheists who attend, but they just don't let their lack of faith intrude on inherited customs of that community. Would you allow a group within a nation to have their own practices based around their own belief or non-belief? That depends on the group, really. Britain has been widely Christian for well over 1,500 years, with very few pagans and never pagan in an organic sense since that time. That is, existing communities that pass down the religion. So apart from incoming faiths from foreigners such as Jews, Muslims and others, I don't see that as an issue worth bearing in mind. If atheists want to identify themselves on the basis that they wholly reject the festivals and traditions of their ancestors, then in my opinion, that reflects most purely on them. I might even argue that an organisation based on opposition to cultural norms and practices would be some form of sedition, and they'd likely be on some kind of police watch list. Organised religions, other than the established religion, I would frown upon, but if they remain within the traditions of the nation, I think I have bigger fish to fry. The main issue is really that there is some kind of religious uniformity to a large extent, and that people, even if not personally religious, see the value of that. Can you go more into what you mean by honour your ancestors? 
Honouring one's ancestors can encompass many things, and is not necessarily limited to one's direct lineage, ancestors, but rather all the forebears in your nation that went before you. It can include, but is not certainly limited to, remembering fallen warriors in war. Here in the UK we have, during November, many commemorations of our dead, which include parades and wreath laying, the wearing of poppies, and reflecting on family members that have died in said wars. It's also about perpetuating the traditions where possible, marking feast days and celebrations in the national calendar. It's about living in the world responsibly so as to be able to pass on the land and inheritance they left to you, to the people that come after you. So why do you believe people should do these things? For the aforementioned reasons. It's about perpetuating a culture and way of life. It's about looking to the past whilst also preparing the road ahead, keeping a flame alight. As you demonstrate, modern generations, by virtue of globalism and social media, are having their roots cut from their heritage. Yet in most cases, and this is quite anecdotal, young folk of my generation find this quite sad. They want to be more connected to nature and their ancestors, and want to be better connected to the past of the land around them. What do you mean by as I demonstrate? I'm not really sure what you mean. No offense taken, I'm just confused. I mean that you often cannot or struggle to wrap your head around why things such as tradition are important and why it's good to keep it alive. It is not a personal criticism, merely a sad observation, one that I hope may change with time. Do you believe that this separation from routes can be stopped? Very much so, and in my opinion the seeds for doing so are very much already sown in. Many on the right mock the eco-friendly nuts they see on Instagram, but personally I welcome it. Younger people are much more environmentally conscious, and are increasingly wanting to live at one with the earth where possible, and with that, a more localised mindset will re-evolve. Such as for example, not shipping in food stuff that can be grown and bred in your own area. People are developing a nature-based spirituality, and also, as race-based politics accelerates, people will become introspective about race. At the moment, many whites are self-loathing, or indifferent about their race. But as what happened in the summer just gone amps up, many will, will come to see it as a racial issue, and hopefully will take the side of their brethren. The events of last summer have done more to further wars of ethnocentrism for both sides than any esoteric meme channel on Discord or Telegram could hope to. Ordinary people were seeing their entire identity being shat on by their cultural elites in favour of another group, and they increasingly don't like it. What is your opinion on the ecological crisis? Should technology become more advanced to circumvent the problem, or do you take a primitivist approach? I like to walk gently on that fine line, and say a mix of both. I'm in favour of technologies that allow us to harness, harness not exploit, renewable energy sources, and in general, those that promote a sustainable lifestyle within nature. For example, I'm in favour of solar and geothermal energy. Overall, I think our nations are critically overpopulated, and ideally, there'd be about as many people as you can domestically feed. As mentioned, in my previous video, a nation of homesteads, at least for the large part, would be most ideal, and if you'll pardon the pun, fruitful. Rearing one's own sheep, perhaps a cow or two, some fowl for eggs, and bees for honey, and plots of vegetables and fruit. We must learn to live not only off the land, but within it, foresting and farming responsibly to keep nature as a gift to each coming generation. How do you solve the overpopulation crisis you believe in? That is a tricky one to solve. To some extent, repatriation of non-Britons would and could aid this significantly. Otherwise, it's a fairly hard one to manage. China's one-child policy was a demographic calamity, as male children were favoured, and as such, they now have a huge imbalance and a very bad gender ratio. I would not like to be a Chinese lad. They've got their work cut out for them. What are your thoughts on the LGBTQ plus population? I fully accept that a small percentage of the population be born with a glitch within their psychology and physical sexuality that makes them more attracted to the other sex. I just completely oppose the normalisation of such conditions within healthy society. Men for the most part should seek to marry a woman, to have children, and then provide the children with a stable family with a mother and father. If most men had any sense of masculine honour, if they were gay, they'd just suck it up, marry, have children, and if they really need to get a release, can lock themselves in their toilet for a bit. And it's not good to writing so many people out of the genetic tree. Many European countries have below replacement levels of breeding, at least in terms of their quote-unquote indigenous populations. What about their wives and husbands? Isn't it a bit strange to have people that aren't attracted to their partner marry? It's not nice, but historically speaking, it's not strange. I'm not against them just remaining single either, but my main gripe is the face of increasingly popular LGBT culture, is that non-familial relationships and ways of life are seen as acceptable and normalised. That doesn't mean that I think those genuinely born with these setbacks are bad people, I just don't think that putting a spotlight on it is healthy for society. What do you think a country such as the United States should do, since it doesn't have a defined ethnic or religious identity? Well, 
I mean, you lot are more or less fucked. The short answer is that I don't really know, and to some extent, I don't really care either. Having said that, some degree of separation is most likely the best way forward. Grant African Americans, Hispanics, and Europeans their own portions, and those of mixed heritage can choose who they most identify with. The 13 colonies of New England that the UK let go in the late 18th century are a world away from what exists now. So you don't believe ethnic cooperation is doable, even if it's within the traditions of a nation? It is doable to some extent, and it generally depends on how removed and similar those ethnic groups are. The problem with the US isn't merely that African Americans happen to live there, it's that their ancestors were captured and brought over in chains, and have existed as a subculture within the US ever since. An essential part of America, but not considered wholly American by many until recently. And they're rightly aggravated by that. I don't see that as a resolvable issue. Each generation of blacks will always demand their pound of flesh from whites. And, a few self-hating, white liberals aside, no one's going to give it to them. And rightly so again. In the last interview, you talked about repatriation to combat the perceived threat of ethnic migration. So how does repatriation actually work? Repatriation would not be an instantaneous matter, and it must be remembered that its primary goal is to merely halt the demographic replacement of Britons in Britain. I am not interested in hunting down every last ethnic minority from every nook and cranny in the UK. First of all, illegal immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers would be evicted, simple as. I would then repeal laws which grant citizenship based on being born here, and instead based on having both parents being British. This would accompany several laws which would in general make it less appealing, or even difficult, for those of ethnic background, ethnic minority background, to live want to live in the UK, covering financial and cultural areas, for example, sending, sending money home, and banning the sale and production of halal and kosher meat. I imagine this would prompt many to leave. At the same time, the government would offer ethnic minority families a lump sum to return back to their ancestral homelands, an offer I reckon many, given the circumstances, would accept. If legal ethnic minorities decide not to take the money and leave, what would the government do? In the unlikely event, the faith with a hostile society and culture, and when many of their rights to live within their own cultural norms are curtailed, they still refuse to take money. Then they will be forcibly deported until their ethnic footprint in the UK is minimal enough not to cause a demographic challenge. What's the difference between integralism and fascism? There is not a huge difference, and in a, and in a strict sense, I do not even necessarily reject the label of fascism. It's just terrible optics for any political movement to use the term. Integralism has a more acute focus on religion as an intrinsic part of the nation. And also fascism often comes with caveats pertaining to expansion, such as with the Third Reich's desire for Lebensraum. Integralism is content more or less with existing national borders, providing of course this offers said ethnic group territorial integrity. Now we're going to get into some viewer questions. Sorry if I get any pronunciations wrong. Egoism Simplified asks, why do you think you owe something to the higher concept of the nation? I believe it's the most natural form of ordering people. It's an extension of the wider family. One shares blood, language, and in most cases land with these people. I also consider it extremely healthy in both a physical and psychological sense to commit yourself to ideals and concepts larger and above oneself. Tatsumi Oga asks, Are there any huge differences between you and Brazilian integralism? I know very little about Brazilian integralism, I'm afraid. On the one hand, Brazil is a Catholic nation, so that would pair up nicely, but Brazil is also not only very multi-ethnic, but also very racially mixed. I imagine, however, there is much in common. Do you have any closing thoughts? In summation, I believe in a society that views itself as a product of generations before, bearing a burden of sacred duty to their next of kin, pass on the land through their blood as untainted as possible. We must reconnect to our ancestors and nature in a spiritual way. As we go about our life, ask ourselves of what we are doing makes our forebears proud. Keeping the flame of tradition alight is a duty we are born into, regardless of our different backgrounds. The coming years will see immense changes to the West, and it will get tribal and ugly. Knowing oneself, one's folklore and history will be paramount in that struggle. Us men are called to be fathers, warriors, and wardens of the land. At the moment, we are largely failing in these tasks. If we are to rise above the tide, we must carry those crosses and rekindle those characters within us. I wish you and your viewers a very Merry Christmas, a blithe Yuletide, and a happy Hogmanay. Thank you for coming on, and thanks for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this, and I hope you had a Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Yule, New Year's, Saturnalia, and now that I think about it, we probably have the audience with some of the most varied winter holidays, but I'll see you next week, and I guess next year.